Imperial Yeast has been up to some interesting things lately, and they recently announced a product we are super excited about. If you're familiar with Imperial Yeast, you're likely aware of their classification system. A is for ale as an AO7 flagship, L is for lager as an L17 harvest, and so on. Well, they recently released the first strain in their I series, which stands for Imperialis and refers to non-GMO hybrids or derivative yeast strains developed by Imperial Yeast that have been honed to exhibit the traits today's brewers most desire. The initial offering, I-22 Capri, is a high hybrid of A38 Juice and A43 Loki, two of Imperial's most popular strains for hop forward IPA. Whether you're into this style or just enjoy juicier fermentation characteristics, you have got to try I-22 Capri. Learn more about the Imperialis project and I-22 Capri at imperialyeast.com. It's highly likely that everybody listening to this show agrees with us that beer is awesome. It's fun to talk about, it's fun to make, it's fun to drink, and it has the added effect of making us feel pretty good. However, there are some folks who choose to refrain from alcohol consumption, whether it be for health reasons or just a month-long dry spell to reset their system. Over the last few years, non-alcoholic beer has grown rapidly in popularity, providing a new beery option for these abstainers, many of whom have gotten into making their own. You're listening to the Brewlosophy Podcast. I'm your host, Marshall Schott, and I'm joined by contributor Cade Job on this episode to discuss the impact mash temperature has when brewing non-alcoholic beer. Yeah, I mean, non-alcoholic beer is something that I've really gotten into uh, over the last few years. Uh, You know, I mean, it just it's nice to have like I I want a beer at night or on the weeknights, but I don't necessarily want to get, you know, drunk. I don't want to drink like more than one beer. Um, So I just I want the taste, but I don't want the alcohol. Uh, And and dry January is the thing that I've started doing, um, you know, and and, uh, been participatory in. And so, yeah, non-alcoholic beers are becoming a part of my life. And it's certainly becoming a part of other people lives too. I mean, look at the grocery store shelves. There's all kinds of non-alcoholic beers out there. Um, And so that's what really uh, inspired me to do this uh, experiment. I wanted to figure out, uh, you know, what are the best ways to make a non-alcoholic beer and mash temperature seemed like a nice, uh, obvious starting point. So yeah, this is going to be a fun one and a good experiment to talk about. Yeah, I I feel like I have a pretty solid grasp of mash temperature in the brewing process. But as regular listeners of this show uh, know, and and so do you, Cade, I'm really not in into non-alcoholic beer at all. Yeah, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> but I do love that it's an option for those who are. I'm all for people coming up with methods to make this stuff. And honestly, the moment I try one that actually tastes good to me, I'll admit it. It's not like I'm, I'm, I've got an issue against it. It's just that to date, I haven't. So I stick to sparkling water when I don't feel like imbibing. Anyway, I just wanted to get that out there up front that this is a definitely not my wheelhouse, which means I'll likely learn something new by talking with you about it today, Cade. All right, if you're a fan of this show and you'd like to receive a reward for your support, consider becoming a patron of Brewlosophy over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. By making a small monthly pledge, you'll receive rewards like access to unpublished contributor recipes, unique discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com, and an invitation to a monthly live Q&A session with somebody in the brewing world. This month's guest is owner of Omega Yeast, Lance Shaner, whose story of how he got into yeast wrangling is quite fascinating. I'm sure he's going to discuss that a bit uh, during his session. Over a decade old at this point, Omega Yeast is known for producing some really innovative yeast strains such as Cosmic Punch and Helio Gazer, which are their thialized strains, as well as a line of more standard ale and lager yeasts. When you're a, a firm nerd like us or just like to learn new things, whether or not that's the case, this session is going to be a blast. To be a part of it, you have to make sure uh, make sure to make your pledge of just $3 or more at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. No later than Friday, May 19th, 2023, as Lance is going to be taking questions that Saturday the 20th. All past sessions are available on our private Patreon and Facebook pages, so you can go back and watch them whenever you like. Learn more about becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. And if you wouldn't mind letting us know what you think about this show by leaving a rating and review an Apple podcast or wherever it is you listen to podcasts, we'd appreciate that immensely as it helps those who haven't heard of us yet to more easily find the show. Plus, we really like knowing what you think of us. 
All right, feedback is brought to you by Clawhammer Supply, who offer brewers various options for high-quality, reasonably-priced electric brewing rigs in various voltages and sizes. I've used their 120-volt system for five-gallon batches and just uh, jumped into their 240-volt, 10-gallon setup, which I'm using with uh, Ryan Hansen right now. I'm telling you, they're awesome. Clawhammer Supply really puts the effort into ensuring that their systems do exactly as they're intended to do in as efficient a way as possible. Not ready to make the jump to electric? They also sell 10 and 20 gallon brew in a bag home brewing starter kits. If you've been considering going electric though, do yourself a favor and visit clawhammersupply.com. We're confident you're going to love their stuff just as much as we do. Listener and longtime Brewlosophy patron Eric Pierce from Massachusetts wrote in after listening to episode 275, where we shared our views on beer glassware. Eric said, I loved the episode, but not mentioning the Sam Adams glass was a pretty glaring omission. (laughs) It's really terrific, scientifically designed, super sexy, and 100% American. I mean, it even has laser-etched nucleation sites on the bottom of the glass. Brilliant! (laughs) <laughs> yeah, Eric, I love you, man. It's good. Yeah, it's good to hear from you. And yeah, totally uh, missed out on that Sam Adams, uh, Sam Adams glassware, you guys. I mean, come on, uh, you know, quintessential American beer there. No, but that was a great episode. I loved it. I, I love seeing people's episodes and how people uh, get so, uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, proud of their glassware, <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> you know. Um, so yeah, thanks, Eric, for sending that in and hope you're doing well, man. Yeah, I, I actually remember if I'm not mistaken, uh, when the gla- Sam Adams glass first came out, I believe it was like 2006 or 2007. Uh, and I somehow ended up with one here in Fresno. I believe they were they were doing, it was either a steal the glass night uh, at a local, uh, like a, a burger joint that has, you know, a really nice craft beer selection. Uh, or they were giving them away. If you bought like a, a, you know, a Sam Adams 12 pack or something, you could like send in for a glass. I remember Stella Artois did that for a while as well. Whatever it was, I ended up with one of these glasses. Uh, I love the shape of it. I think the beer looks really good in it. You're right, Eric. It's super sexy. And, and the small bubbles coming up from the nucleation site, it really does look good. Is it one of my favorites, which is what the point of that episode was? Not really. I, I don't have that glass anymore. I can almost guarantee I broke it because that's what I do. Uh, but I can see how it might be a go-to beer glass for some people, especially those who just happen to live in the Boston area and are proud to be near Sam Adams. Uh, sort of like you, Eric. <laughs> like kind, Eric. <laughs> yeah, it's your hometown sort of thing. Uh, now, I've heard some complaints about those glasses or any glass that has nucleation sites. Uh, Uh, Like, oh, you know, you're going to reduce the carbonation in the beer faster. And, you know, on a technical level, I guess that makes sense. But that was never my experience. I think most of us are drinking beer far too fast to notice a difference in carbonation level caused by nucleation sites that make small bubbles rise to the top. Now, just a little side note. uh, Eric Pierce was one of the 2018 Sam Sam Adams long shot winners for this grisette style beer that he made. And he actually sent me some. It was fantastic. So he's arguably a bit biased as well. But we'll let him have it. We love you eric thank you for calling us out uh, if you have show feedback you can send it to feedback at brewlosophy.com or drop us a note on social media if you haven't already please go subscribe to our youtube channel the brewlosophy show at youtube.com slash at the brewlosophy show that's the at symbol followed by the brewlosophy show no umlaut needed uh, martin is absolutely slaying it over there which is evidenced by the fact that we're already pushing fifteen thousand subscribers after just a couple months of being out very exciting. I think of uh, the viewers of, of the Brewlosophy show are really enjoying it. So it's pretty nuts. All right. When we're back from this break, our focus will be on the impact of mash temperature when brewing non-alcoholic lager. Chilling work can be a chore, especially after a long brew day, but not with the Exchillerator Counterflow Chiller, which can chill a 5-gallon or 19-liter batch of wort in 5 minutes or less, leading to a strong cold break and clearer wort in the fermenter. Brewlosophy's Matt Del Fiaco uses the Exchillerator Max and absolutely loves it. In addition to improved chilling efficiency, every Exchillerator comes with a 5-year warranty that covers the entire chiller for manufacturer defects. If you're looking to up your chilling game and a CFC is right for you, head over to Exchillerator.com today. As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world, carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic, as well as other ingredients and gear, Yakima Valley Hops has it all. And don't forget to check out their new podcast, 
the late edition where the YVH crew goes into depth on our favorite plant with industry experts. Head over to yakimavalleyhops.com now to see all they have to offer and subscribe to the late edition wherever it is you listen to podcasts. There's no denying that stainless steel is the best material for brewing equipment, and Delta Brewing Systems offers some of the lowest prices on high-quality stainless gear, like the Firm Tank, which in addition to holding 8 gallons or 30 liters of work, comes with a domed lid to even further reduce the chances of a messy blow-off. Plus, it can hold up to 4 PSI of pressure for closed transfers. Delta Brewing Systems also has their own line of brew kettles, as well as one of the lowest-priced all-in-one electric brewing systems out there, and their prices are shockingly low. If you're in the market for legit stainless gear that won't break the bank, Do yourself a favor and head over to DeltaBrewingSystems.com today. There's a common adage that brewers make wort while yeast makes beer. And in order to produce wort, it is absolutely necessary that a mash be performed. Sure, one can purchase malt extract. That's great. Uh, All you have to do is mix it with water and then you have your wort. But that malt extract was made from wort, uh, which could only have come from the mashing process. Suffice to say, the mash is an absolutely essential part of the brewing process and one that has gotten increased focus among those interested in making non-alcoholic beer. And for good reason, let's start off by talking a bit about why this is the case, Cade. Yeah, of course. I mean, like you said, we, we always say brewers make wort and yeast make beer, um, but we, you need both, right? Brewers need yeast to make alcohol and yeast needs wort <laughs> to make alcohol. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, you know, so the, there's a mutual relationship there for sure. Um, and so, yeah, that's the, the wort making process, right? And, and that's the mash. That's what happens. I mean, of course, there's a, there's a, a it's a scientific process that goes on where we're converting uh, non-fermentable starches into fermentable sugars that the yeast can uh, can can use. It's an enzyme catalyzed process, which means which means that enzymes are making it happen faster um, than if you just you know than um, if you were led to let it go naturally without enzymes. Um, it probably wouldn't happen without enzymes, but that's neither here nor there. Um, <laughs> it, it basically it's just that that conversion again, that conversion of starches um, that are bound up in malted barley into fermented sugars that the yeast can then take and turn into alcohol or at least traditionally right that's what we want um and when we're making alcoholic beers is starch conversion into fermentable sugar but that might not be the case whenever we're uh trying to do non-alcoholic uh beers and, and that's the key is that we have a very good understanding. Last week's episode was on the art and science of beer. The mash is a very scientifically understood process. We know what's happening. We know, we've even been able to show us, crazy weirdos at Brewlosophy have been able to show that different mash temperatures within the, you know, uh, uh, amylase act, enzyme activity range absolutely has an objective impact on the uh, constitution of the wort that you make. Now, does it have a sensory impact? We have not been able to support that very often, but uh, it does have an impact. Now, what what do we know about your typical beer, you know, your typical beer mash temperature that lower temperatures, and when we say lower, we're talking, you know, 146 Fahrenheit to 152, that's about 63 to 66 C, favors beta amylase enzymes, which uh, produce shorter chain sugars uh, that are more readily metabolized by yeast, leading to higher attenuation and thus more alcohol. Some people would contend that it produces a drier beer. If we are using the term drier as a a, a, a description of an objective Uh, objectively measurable thing, lower finishing gravity, then yes, it does produce a drier beer. Uh, There's an argument to be made that you cannot taste drier necessarily, uh, at least you know when you're comparing lower mash temperatures to relatively higher mash temperatures. That is for another episode. We've hit it before. We'll hit it again. Uh, Now, higher mash temperatures are going to favor this alpha amylase enzyme. That's like 156 to 162 Fahrenheit, I think is kind of a common range, 69 to 72 C. And in in this, those enzymes, the alpha amylase is going to produce longer chain dextrins that aren't metabolized by yeast as easily, leading to lower attenuation and thus less alcohol. If you take two of the exact same mashes, same exact grain bill, same water chemistry, everything about them is identical. Mash one at 146 F or 63 C, mash the other one at 162 F or 72 C. Those beers are going to finish with different finishing gravities, despite starting at the same OG. 
Uh, those different finishing gravities, that difference is gonna mean there's a difference in alcohol level. It means there's a difference in uh, the dextrins that exist in that wort. But we know that when we mash warm, we're going to have less alcohol. My perspective these days when it comes to mash temperature is that it is a knob that we can use to adjust the level of alcohol in beer without surprisingly, having much of a perceptible impact on aroma, flavor, or mouthfeel. And and the reason I say that is because I feel like it feeds nicely into why it's become a thing for those who are interested in non-alcoholic beer brewing. Yeah, and of course, the key thing to remember here is optimal temperature ranges, right? Exactly. Whenever Marshall's yeah. talking about, yeah, lower temperatures versus high temperatures, you know, 146 Fahrenheit to, you know, 162 Fahrenheit or, you know, from 63 to 72. Those are the optimal temperature ranges. And that's kind of what's important um, when you're when you're looking at, you know, why this matters for this experiment, but also for non, non-alcoholic non brewing, right? And, and, and we look at like, you know, like 152. 153 is kind of like the average that that in Fahrenheit 152 153 something like 65 66 67 Celsius um, as like the the nice middle ground for amylase and beta amylase or for alpha and beta amylase activity that doesn't mean that they don't work outside of those ranges and that's what, that's one thing that I want to keep in mind today whenever we talk about this they're just optimal it's not the functional ranges okay there are functional temperature ranges right so there are, you know, uh, temperatures where alpha and beta amylase don't really work very much. They might work just a little bit, but they don't work very much. Um, basically, mostly just don't function. That's at like low temperatures, like room temperature. So if you were, you know, just to steep grains in uh, regular room temperature uh, water, the alpha and beta amylases aren't going to be at a high enough temperature to do what they need to be able to do. Now, that's not necessarily an enzymatic function, but that's a whole, you know, nutshell of things that I won't get into. <laughs> and the same thing, there's there's high temperatures too, right? So anything over right, like 170 Fahrenheit or like 76, 75 Celsius, um, those temperatures are going to going to result in denaturation of those enzymes at that high temperature. So amylases aren't going to work as well uh, at those higher temperatures. That's kind of why we have this nice, you know, temperature range that we can work in when we're working with alcoholic uh, fermentations. Right. And so that's where you get into this question of, okay, well, if I want to make a non-alcoholic beer, how can I use those outer edges, right? The cold temperature and the high temperature to maybe not produce as much alcohol as I normally would when brewing beer, right? Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let, here's what we're going to do. We're going to, we're going to put a pin in mash temperature as it relates to non-alcoholic brewing really quick. Now, Kate and I actually did an entire brews use episode where we discussed our opinions on non-alcoholic beer. That's how Cade knows my opinion so well. Uh, that was back, <laughs> that was back in episode 226 for anybody who's interested in listening to that. Uh, I believe we may have also touched on the various methods that people are using to make these types of beers, but I think it'd be good to quickly at least kind of just brush over those uh, before we get into the methods of the, that are the focus of this episode, which is mash temperature, only because uh, they are not methods that I think most people are familiar with who are making regular beer, right? Alcoholic beer. So, uh, and we have a we have a great article. It was actually one of our very few uh, guest articles on the website uh, on the brewing of low or no alcohol beers, and and they go into detail discussing all of this. So, the first one, uh, just again, really quickly, is to ferment with yeast that just produces little alcohol. It up front. Now, there are not very many of these, but uh, a couple of labs have come out with these, these yeast strains that just don't have the quality uh, uh, or the trait, I should say, of producing very much alcohol, despite still metabolizing those sugars that are in the wort. Well, yeah, I mean, it's interesting that there there are some that we think of as brewers that don't produce or, you know, that, that don't that produce little alcohol in wort. And that's these things like you're talking about that yeast labs have come out with like Torula spora del brecchii exactly, and some of these yeah, wild, yeah. wild yeasts. But there's a huge group of yeasts that people don't uh, that, that brewers don't often think about That's wine yeasts. Huh. <laughs> so why, why a lot of wine yeasts can't consume maltose um, or, or, or maltotriose. Uh, 
Uh, they can consume glucose and fructose or sucrose. Um, you know, sucrose is just a combination of glucose and fructose. That's like table sugar. Right. Um, you know, they can consume those really well, but they can't consume maltose. It's actually one of the, def- or like one of, um, if I understand correctly, one of the defining characteristics with wine yeast. But yeah, but the, the long and short of that is there are certain yeast strains that in brewer's wort don't produce alcohol. And that could be because they don't, con- it's mostly because they don't consume maltose. Maltose yeah. and maltotriose are the biggest portion of a brewer's wort and then glucose as well uh, to, to some extent. Um, you know, so, so that is a big deal. That's an easy way to do it. Find one of these yeasts that doesn't consume, uh, you know, alcohol. But there's also process variables that you can do too, right? That I would call that like a raw ingredient variable. And another thing is also just brew with very little grain, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I think you, that's you pretty can, standard for NA beer anyways, right? Yeah. Oh, sure. Totally. Yeah. I mean, you're going to use very little grain in a non-alcoholic beer, but you could even use less. You know, I mean, I'm talking about like, like, uh, you know, uh, brew a beer that's 1.002 specific gravity and then ferments down to 1.001, <laughs> you know, or, 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 or something that there's just not enough sugar in. Yeah. Um, you know, you can you can also dilute back, which is another way you can make an alcoholic beer and then just add a crap load of water to it, um, you know, and that waters it down to whatever, um, you know, level of alcohol alcohol that you're trying to get to. Uh, those are kind of like what I would consider like ingredient pieces, but then there's process pieces like, uh, you know, the, 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 like, uh, arrested fermentation. That's like stopping the fermentation at very early in, in fermentation. So like 12 to 18 hours into fermentation, crashing your beer, uh, you know, uh, or, 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 you know, the, uh, you, yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of other different ones. I mean, I well, want to monopolize that. <laughs> well, I mean, I would say one of the one of the issues that I have with some of the many commercial uh, uh, NA beers that I've tried is that they taste like fermentation either never happened or <laughs> was arrested way too early. Uh, they mm-hmm. just taste like wort to me, like watery wort, and it's just not very good. Uh, but that is one. Another one is alcohol volatiliz- volatilization. And this is one I've heard a lot of people talk about way back when we were talking about session IPA and stuff like that, that, you know, it, it's a little risky because it involves heating up fermented beer to drive off alcohol. Alcohol. Uh, one way that I heard of somebody doing this to keep oxidation at bay uh, was was to put your beer into a keg, you know, nice purged keg. You've got your five percent beer in there, whatever it may be, uh, and then you put that into a hot water bath, and then you just purge the alcohol off, you know, as it's as it's evaporating off. Basically, um, I don't think oxygen would get in. I'm not sure how good that beer would taste. I've never had one knowingly, uh, you know, so I can't I can't comment on that. But I think the most common uh, approach to making non-alcoholic beer these days is pairing, you know, a, a smaller grain bill naturally with some form of uh, mash temperature adjustment that's way outside of that range that we consider typical. Yeah, well, and one one more that I think w- is more popular for commercial brewers with the equipment is membrane filtration. So you can actually uh, filter out the yeah. alcohol. I think that's probably the most common way non-alcoholic beers are brewed, on, like on a commercial level. But that's not necessarily something that home brewers can can do. Right? Um, maybe you can get that sort of equipment and and have the kind of time to filter out the alcohol. Um, you know, but uh, uh, yeah, mash temperature, like you said, I think for home brewers, mash temperature with a low grain bill is the 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 most the easiest and most approachable way for sure right because it doesn't require you know knowledge of a new yeast it doesn't require you know measuring and stopping your fermentation it doesn't require putting a keg in a water bath or membrane <laughs> filtration i mean it's just playing with tools that we're already knowing we comfortable and we're comfortable with um and so there are a couple of different mash methods that you can use to make non-alcoholic beer and we can start with the cold mash method and so like i said was talking earlier about the optimum range for those enzymes there's a high and a low and this would be playing around in the low side right um mm-hmm. and, and so it's it's at room temperature essentially um you know, you you mash, you put the beer in room temperature water, somewhere between 65 to 80 Fahrenheit or 18 to 25 Celsius, something like that. Um, and just let the malt soak. Uh beta amylase 
it could technically be active at this temperature, right? Alpha amylase, probably not very much. Beta amylase, also not very much. But we're not really worried about conversion happening at this at this uh, temperature range. We're not looking for enzymes to take, uh, you know, the starches and convert those into fermentable sugars. What we're looking here at here is just malt already contains free, uh, like maltose, glucose, and fructose in it. It's because of, you know, the malting process. Process. I mean, it just it sort of happens that there's uh, some conversion. The amylases start to take effect. Yeah. So there's some conversion. And also, like, the grains themselves just have glucose and fructose around because they need energy to germinate and do that sort of stuff. So there are free, sh- free fermentable sugars in the grain. So all we're trying to do is essentially just rinse those out. You just need water to get in there you know, uh, solubilize those sugars and then extract them out. Uh, and, and if you think about it, this is a super easy method method, right? You just take in water out of the tap or wherever your brewing water is, and you're just soaking the grains for a period of time to just extract those free sugars. Yeah. Those free sugars will ferment down to about, you know, zero to a half a percent and boom, you've got a non-alcoholic beer. Yeah. Or a very, very low alcohol beer. I think yes, uh, yeah. the, the, I'm not sure what the legal definition, I think it's yeah. under, 05 percent is non-alcoholic. Yeah, non-alcoholic anything. in the U.S. Yeah, yeah exactly. Non-alcoholic in the U.S. <laughs> yeah. Under zero point five. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's less alcohol in it than there is in your cough medicine. We'll put it that way. Uh, but but yeah. when it comes to the cold mashing, which is also known as non-enzymatic mashing or the NEM uh, method. My knowledge of all of this is based purely on my experience with uh, mashing in general, but also my, you know, what I've read, what I've heard from other people. Anybody who has any experience making beer uh, all grain and and knows, you know, at least a little bit about what the mash does, how it works, can understand what cold mashing does. You're you're just it's it's non enzymatic. Not that those enzymes are denatured; they are still totally uh, there. They're they're just not active. Those aren't that is not the temperature that's going to tickle the act. Activity out of beta or alpha amylase. So you've got to keep that in mind for a couple of reasons. Um, w- one thing that I hear about cold mashing, and I'm not sure it is a universally practiced deal, uh, but a lot of people online seem to seem to claim that cold, if you're going to cold mash, you want to let that mash sit for like overnight for quite a long time, just to let whatever's in the, the those grains dissolve, which is going to go slower in a colder, you know, a colder mash uh, dissolve into the, into the liquid. Um, other people claim that doing it for an hour uh, is equally as effective. So that, that's one thing to consider. Uh, but another thing is when that <laughs> when you're heating that up, that wort up, you probably don't want to let it sit for too long in the uh, that that alpha and beta amylase activity range, that 146 to 152, because that will activate those amylase enzymes and it will start to do the conversion that you were trying to avoid by cold mashing in the first place. So one of the things that I've read is to rather rapidly raise that uh, that word up to a boil. You want to get past the amylase enzyme range, temperature range, uh, as quickly as you can so that you are keeping any uh, conversion of those starches into actual fermentable sugars at bay. Yeah, and and of course, take the grains out. Yeah, um, as <laughs> yeah. you're raising it, right? You know, it's a that one. It, it it seems obvious to say that, but when whenever you're actually you know like using this method, you start to think about well, like wait, wait, when should I take the grains out? Should I just take it out after they've been sitting there, or should I let it go up through you know some of that sacrification temperature, like 150, 140, and then take it out you know before it gets to the boil? And this is where you know, I mean, again, you're right. Last week, you and I talked about art versus science. This is where you get into a little bit of that artistic uh, you know artistic choice how long to steep the grains whether that's one hour versus overnight versus you know I don't know 48 hours if you wanted to do that um, and then how when, how and when to take the grains out um, is a piece of it uh, you know but sort of at the at the uh, extreme end at the shortest end you know you can make non-alcoholic beer by steeping your grains for one hour at you know room temperature and then take the grains out raise it up to a boil and you're off to the races Right. just like brewing that's a that is a a method that brewers use cold mashing or non enzymatic mashing the other side is higher temperature um so up at that like 170 to 180 fahrenheit or like 77 to 82 celsius and at this point you are denaturing the enzymes um so the temperature in the in the liquid is actually going to cause the enzymes not to work right um amylases typically denature around 170 fahrenheit or 77 celsius 
So if you're above those levels, they'll denature and they'll denature rapidly. Now, they're not totally eliminated. You know, they will over a period of time. But, you know, if you're only at that level for 10 or 15 minutes, you know, there's still going to be some amylase activity, a short amount of amylase activity. Uh, but but uh, for the most part, you're totally just getting rid of the enzymes. So what are you doing up there? Well, you're kind of doing the same thing. You're solubilizing those free fermentable sugars, right? You're getting those out of the liquid and that's what the yeast will then use to uh, to ferment. But at these temperatures, there is going to be a little bit of amylase activity. So there are going to be some dextrins that are created, first, which is different than the cold uh, cold mashing or, or non-enzymatic mashing, right? You're not creating dextrins because amylases aren't really working. Um, and even though amylases are denaturing, there is still some activity. These dextrins are what provide a lot of mouthfeel and flavor um, to beer that gives beer its beer flavor. Uh, and and um, if you're, you know, if you're uh, interested at some point to figure out like what is a dextrin and what does it taste like um, <laughs> it's basically that residual leftover sugar right when your OG doesn't get down to zero to 1.00 it gets down to 1.10 or 1.20 or whatever you know your your 1.020 wherever you're fermenting at those are dextrins those are residual starch molecules dextrins oligosaccharides that are stuck um, in the beer that didn't turn into fermentable sugars and so there's a flavor component to those. There's a non-fermentability component to it. And kind of that's where you're trying to get to this. I want my non-alcoholic beer to taste like beer and beer has dextrins in it. So rather than, you know, uh, making a beer that's just extracting maltose and glucose and fructose, the free versions, I'm also going to put some dextrins into the beer, which we have flavor components to them. Yeah. And that's going to play into your decision on which of these two methods to use. Uh, Just from the, the reading that I've done, if I'm trying to make a no alcohol beer, an NA beer, I'm going high mash temperature all the way. Again, influenced by what I've read online, which I think is what a, a lot of people are doing right now and when it comes to brewing these types of beers. Just a little disclaimer uh, that anybody who has ever accidentally, say, uh, mashed a beer at a 165 when they were aiming for, I don't know, uh, you know, 148 or something knows that your FG is just going to, to be higher. Uh, that's the way <laughs> that's the way it works. And it's it's I love how predictable it is. That tickles that sciencey side of me again. Um, if you go to if you hit the, the the web and you start looking for ways to brew and you see oh high mash temperature you'll probably see a range of like 162 because that's the upper end basically of the typical amylase mashing range uh, 162 to 2180 uh, the the disclaimer I want to give is if you're really truly trying to make a non alcoholic beer say for somebody who doesn't drink alcohol at all you're gonna want to go above uh, you're gonna want to go much higher around you're gonna want to hit like one 180 or 82 C Uh, because that is where you are denaturing the enzymes that are going to convert that starch into fermentable sugar. Anything under that, you're probably still going to get a little bit of activity. And the closer you get to that 162 Fahrenheit or 72 C mark, the more alcohol there will absolutely be in the beer. So just keep that in mind. We are talking about non-alcoholic beer, not low alcohol beer. So so there's a reason that we're going to push that higher mash temperature just a little bit more. I don't want to confuse anybody on that. Uh, Now, let's talk a little bit about the style of beer that you ended up focusing on for the experiment we're going to get to later, which is a pale lager. If for you, it was a hoppy lager, but really this beer style was, was, was just a dry hopped pale lager. Um, (laughs) and, and what we might expect from that style brewed using either of these cold mashing or high mash temperature methods. Yeah, I mean, of course, right? And so one of the reasons why I wanted to start with a lager is because if you look at most of the non-alcoholic beer options out there, people are usually trying, or they're usually lagers, right? I mean, as certainly traditionally, I'm not talking about athletics offerings or any of the like local brewery offerings, but you know, Bud Zero, Heineken Zero, um, all these other ones are lager beers that taste like beer uh, and, 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 and they're lagers, right? I mean, they're lagers with no alcohol. Uh, so that's why I wanted to do the lager thing. But having had a number of those, 
I know that I prefer a little bit of fruity character <laughs> in my lagers, right? I think it's a good uh, way I'm to gonna, hide the non-alcohol versions of the, the, the faults yeah. in those. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, you know, and and another thing too, and this wasn't a purpose for this, you know, f- you know, for for this uh, why I chose to add hops, you know, or do a hoppy lager. But those dextrins, some of those dextrins can add starchy characters, like potatoey. Like if you licked a, a a raw potato, it can add that sort of character. And I know that I get that sometimes in some non-alcoholic beers. Yeah. Uh, but you can cover that up with hops. And again, I wasn't trying to cover that up. Um, I just wanted like a lager, but I didn't want to make just a light, you know, lager. I wanted to make something that tasted good. I was worried about it being watery and thin and wanted some hops to, you know, up the flavor. And one thing um, that I considered when deciding this and ultimately decided, yeah, I'm going to add hops is hop creep. Okay, because hop creep is going to add enzymes. Um, And we know that when we add dry hops to beer with dextrins in it, that we generally see a bump um, in the in the 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 gravity and then a decrease in the gravity, which means that sugars were either added or liberated, um, you know, from those dextrins and then turned into alcohol and CO2. So I was a little bit worried about that. And that's why you'll see that I use a light hand on the hoppy additions. But we'll get there uh, whenever we we get into the actual, uh, you know, breakdown of what, what I did in the recipe. But again, I just thought, you know, Hey, I, this is what I would want to drink. If I were drinking a, uh, non-alcoholic beer, I love light alcohol, uh, light alcoholic beers, uh, you know, or light lagers. And that's what I love to drink. Um, and so I was trying to create the same thing, but make it taste good. Uh, you know, yeah. if you don't have alcohol in Miller light, I'm not sure why you drink Miller light. Um, <laughs> it's because it tastes so good, man. <laughs> It's, it's, it tastes great and it's less love, filling. That's less uh, filling. Never let you down. You know, yeah, <laughs> never let you down. Exactly. Uh, but I, that's what I want. I just wanted something that I would want to drink. So like making a hoppy lager sounded like a really good idea, uh, you know, for trying out. I, th- I think this was actually uh, Brilosophy's first foray into non-alcoholic beers, yeah. um, you know, or experiments that might impact non-alcoholic beers. So again, I, th- I like that style and I thought the style was a good choice. Yeah. And not only first, it's been our only so far, but I know that you've got some other ones planned. Now, the low lowest I've ever mashed was 146 degrees Fahrenheit or 63C. It was a red IPA that I made many years ago. And I'll admit it was completely by accident. I just undershot my my strike temp. Something was wrong with my thermometer, I guess. The highest I've ever mashed was around 165 degrees Fahrenheit or 74C. Uh, and that was in a short and shoddy session IPA that ended up tasting like utter trash. You can read about that on the website. All of the other beers that I've brewed to date have been mashed somewhere between those two temperatures. Now, if there's one thing I've learned from the hundreds of experiments that we've performed, it's that mash temperature absolutely influences attenuation, but that it doesn't seem to have that big of a perceptible impact. Despite beers mashed at different temps, having vastly different finishing gravities and different ABVs, people cannot seem to tell them apart. This definitely seems to support the idea that mash temperature can be used to reduce or perhaps even eliminate alcohol in non-alcoholic beer. This was exactly what you were interested in testing out, Cade. We're going to get to those experiment results right after this break. Family-owned Atlantic Brew Supply is the largest homebrew shop in the Southeast. No gimmicks, no multinational corporate overlords, and no BS. They offer exclusive malts, yeast, and more from local artisans, as well as award-winning recipe kits. They also sell professional brewing gear and cask equipment from sister companies ABS Commercial and Cask Supply. Most ingredients are available by the ounce, plus Atlantic Brew Supply has an on-site calculator to help you craft your best brew. Orders are processed same day, and two-day shipping is guaranteed for East Coast customers. Get 15% off your first order using promo code Brewpod. That's B R U P O D at AtlanticBrewSupply.com. After a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste more time chilling wort. I've tried so many different options, and ultimately, I settled on the super efficient immersion chillers made by Jaded Brewing. With the King Cobra and Hydra, I'm able to chill my entire batch of wort from boiling to just a few degrees above groundwater temperature in as little as six minutes. If an immersion chiller is right for your brewery, then do yourself a favor and check out all of the rad options Jaded Brewing has to offer at jadedbrewing.com. And be sure to let them know Brewlosophy sent you. (laughs) 
Many, many years ago, I viewed mash temperature as a way to control the sweetness and or dryness of my beer. Though following a series of experiments, I now view it uh, more as a way to control the alcohol content in the beer. I don't even think it has any impact or much of an impact on mouthfeel as much as people want to say that it does. And that's purely based on our experiences with these experiments. Now, theoretically, it makes sense to me that mashing outside of the range where beta and alpha amylase are active, uh, whether that's cooler or warmer, could result in a finished product that tastes like beer but doesn't pack the boozy punch. Cade, as somebody who actually enjoys this stuff, you <laughs> designed an experiment to compare Jeez. these two approaches to making them. <laughs> Jeez, your, your derision is coming through on, on air. I, I don't hate <laughs> do it. Do you actually I just, enjoy I, this stuff? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I do. I do. Uh, and I'm not alone. Okay? I know you're I'm not, not alone. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know, as somebody that enjoys this stuff, I thought, hey, I want to make a beer that that's a non-alcoholic beer and I, and I want to try that at home. Um, and so again, like I said, the easiest place to start at for a home brewer is just changing your mash temperature. So yeah, I wanted to look at uh, the difference between doing like the cold non ends enzymatic mash versus the hot, uh, you know, which is like over, uh, you know, those denature, denaturization, denaturation, denaturation. There <laughs> I we don't go. know. <laughs> I got it. Denatura- denaturation uh, temperatures uh, so that the enzymes just wouldn't be as active at those high temperatures or low temperatures. So, yeah, um, you know, I mean, did, I designed a dual five gallon batch of a uh, non-alcoholic hoppy lager. Um, and since it was a lager, I used 100 percent Pilsner malt, which um, get this. This is my favorite part about this it was 2.25 pounds of grain uh, for a five gallon batch 2.25 pounds that's about a kilo <laughs> Are you right or is that backwards I think that's about uh, a kilo yeah, yeah. No, I think you're yeah right. about yeah. a kilo right it's about a kilo of grains uh, for a five gallon batch uh, and to like if you look at the pictures on the website you can see that's like no grain I mean it might have been like four or five handfuls <laughs> It's nothing. I mean, I mean, you, two two point two five pounds is like an afterthought. <laughs> I could, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing yeah. there. So I, I kind of felt like, kind of felt like that. It's like I might have used two point two five pounds to adjust a gravity that I missed or something. You know, <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, it was like no grains, and I, I remember being like shocked the first time I did it. I was like, wow, okay. Now, yeah, uh, and and again, I was targeting like a ten ten or uh, a ten uh, a ten ten starting gravity, I think, or something like that. Uh, whenever I designed the recipe. Um, but okay, so we've got the grains, I mill those, and then this is where the variable comes in. Uh, I uh, put one uh, set of grains into the hot mash, so that was at 180 Fahrenheit or 82 Celsius, and then the other set of grains went into the cold mash, 76 degrees Fahrenheit or 24 Celsius, and both of them uh, got 60 minute mash rests. So, you know, uh, one of the questions I'm sure people would ask is, why did you do the cold mash at just an hour? Yeah. Um, And the answer is because there's evidence or there's uh, indication that that's what people are doing Um, but also I wanted to start there right start at this point to see like okay what is just the cold mash for an hour do versus the hot mash for an hour can you make a beer doing both yeah and and I think a a good argument for that as well is it does mash length I mean we've done experiments just on mash length alone anyways is that going to contribute uh, something on its own that ultimately ends up becoming an extraneous variable so this it was just one way to keep things exactly the same could we come back and revisit it in the future absolutely i I totally see the argument for doing it the way if it becomes the way that is promoted then yes then that becomes kind of its own approach right but in this one we were keeping everything as equal as possible and so this seemed the cleanest approach yeah exactly so again both both mashes got a a 60 minute rest one at 180 fahrenheit 82c the other one at room temperature 76 fahrenheit 24c Um, so after the 60 minute mash rest i removed the grains from both batches and yes that includes the cold mash so the cold (laughs) mash is still down at 60 76 fahrenheit um and notice that there was still a huge amount of unconverted starch in the cold mash batch i mean there was a a, you can actually like see like the starch molecules are just kind of like sitting on top there i've never really seen that like chunks of starch um but yeah it was just kind of still setting there so i mean there was still a lot of unconverted starch in the cold mash batch the hot mash batch just looked like wort um so it it looked totally normal um so yeah remove the grains and then raise them both to boiling temperature um i boiled 
both of the worts uh, for 60 minutes and added a bittering addition, which was five grams of Magnum. Again, that was like eight pellets, <laughs> you know, um, um, and, at, uh, and then uh, boiled those at 60 minutes. Again, that was to around 12 IBUs. And uh, another thing here is I had heard that you don't want to over bitter a non-alcoholic beer. Right. Um, so, you know, even getting to like 20 IBUs could create a bitter bomb. Yeah. So I've I heard- was just, you know. Yeah, I, I've heard the same thing. Uh, and, and another thing to, to point out here is that despite calling this a hoppy lager, this was the only hop edition uh, this this received. And I think if I if I recall our conversation correctly, your point was to reduce the IBU as much as possible, which also contributed to your decision to add more hops in the dry hop just to get that that hop character that you might have gotten otherwise if you were to add more hops to the boil, just sans bitterness, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I'd heard a lot of anecdotes about like using hops at different times in the boil, and it just creeps your IBU up every time you add something in the boil. Yeah, you know. And I mean, if you're adding two grams at sixty minutes, are you even adding anything? You know, if you're going two grams, two grams, two grams, or something like that. But anyway, just to make it clean and nice, we just did that. Was the only hot side addition uh, was the five grams of Magnum at sixty minutes to about twelve IBUs. Um, so then after the boil, uh, normal chilling process, uh, chill them quickly using the the uh, immersion chillers uh, that I have, um, rack identical volumes to sanitized fermenters, and then I measured the original gravity. And so this is where things get a little bit interesting. Yeah. The hot mash was 1.009 OG. So again, I was targeting 1.10. And the cold mash was only 1.004 OG. So right there, we've got evidence that amylase activity was higher uh, when mashed at 180 degrees Fahrenheit, um, you know, versus the one that was mashed at 76 Fahrenheit. That's 82 to 24 C. Uh, and that would explain, I mean, that is the only, to me, uh, a valid explanation for why the hot mash was five points, specific gravity po- points higher than the cold mash, is that you had some amylase activity and that was pushing it to 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Imagine if you had gone a little bit lower or a little lower than that or a little lower than that. That OG would come up. Now, you use such a small amount of grain that chances are you're not going to crack much higher than 10, 12 or so anyways, you know, which is what? What's that three degrees Play-Doh? I mean, that, that is just that, that's that's where most beers finish. Right. And so uh, you, you already this is going to be a low alcohol beer. Uh, I think there's an argument to be made. And this is kind of an aside for people who are trying to make more flavorful. And I'm not trying to diss your recipe here, Cade, but more flavorful <laughs> beers with lower or no alcohol and using, you know, even a normal five gallon recipe uh, with say 12 pounds of malt, but they're mashing it much higher. I- I'd be interested to see just how low alcohol you could get doing that process. But that is for another conversation. Uh, 1009 versus 1004. Very interesting objective finding right here. Yeah, totally. I mean, that would be a lot of fun. Like use the use a, uh, you know, like regular amount of grains uh, yeah. and see what you get, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, using these is just just see what happens. Maybe that's a good BIY or something. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> uh, it w- would be cool to see. Uh, all right. So, yeah, the, the slight difference in OG, which makes sense based on the science. Um, so the words, again, were chilled uh, and uh, put put into uh, sanitized fermenters in equal amounts and then put in over into my fermentation chamber. Um, and I used uh, Imperial Yeast's L25 Heige, I think is how you say it. No um, clue. At 50, <laughs> uh, yeah, me, yeah. At uh, 50 Fahrenheit or 10 C uh, for each of these batches. So Heige is a, a normal Saccharomyces cerevisiae strain. That's not a unique one uh, that that's specific to non-alcoholic beers or anything. It's a normal brewing strain. I think it's actually a Pistoriana strain. I think it's a. I think it's a legit well, well, lager yeast go. strain. Yeah. So, um, so it is. It is a. Yeah. It, it's a standard lager yeast. Uh, and and I and I'm glad. You know, it, it, as much as we ferment our lager yeast warm, I'm glad you went for this one. A nice cool. I mean, you're making a lager beer. You're going with a standard lager fermentation temperature using a standard lager yeast. Very good. Yeah. I mean, also not trying to you know generate you know a whole bunch of alcohol. So you know lower temperatures. It's just the yeast is going to go slower. Yeah. To, even if there's ability for it to turn, uh, you know, to, to make alcohol. Uh, and the other thing, too, I- here is uh, that I knew I was going to add hops um, to it. And so I wanted to try to avoid as much of that hop creep um, as I could because I did what I was afraid of is that I was just going to add these dry hops to this beer uh, and then the one that had the dextrins in it was just going to ferment crazy right it was just going to like just start chopping away (laughs) Um, and I was going to end up with something like 
two or three or four percent um, and not, you know, less than 0.5. But of course, I did add dry hops um, and that was after five days of fermentation. I added five grams each of Brew One, El Dorado and Talus. Uh, so that was my dry hop edition. And each batch got the dry hop edition of Brew One, El Dorado and Talus. Now, I just want to make a quick comment on that. Again, we referred to this as a hoppy lager. I mean, this is 15 grams of dry hop altogether in a <laughs> in a five gallon batch. That's not a huge dry hop. This really is, you know, looking like a, just an attempt to get some hop character in there without the bitterness. So again, it's not like these hops are going to be covering up. You know, we get that argument a lot. Well, if you wouldn't have hopped it so much, then it would have you would have probably tasted the difference. I don't think fifty a fifteen gram dry hop is really going to do that. It's going to have that effect. Yeah, again, and this is a non-alcoholic beer, right? So there's no alcohol there that you're trying to like balance against. That alcohol is going to provide a lot of sweetness and a lot of flavor. So we're not trying to balance against that. It's you know, it, it's it. You need a light hand um, whenever you're doing uh, and making non-alcoholic beers. So yeah, all just 15 grams. That's it. I mean, there was 20 grams total of hops in the whole thing. <laughs> you know, in a five-gallon <laughs> batch. That's yeah. less than an ounce in the entire five-gallon batch of beer. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is a very very low amount uh, of dry hops. Um, and then so that was at five days of fermentation. I let the beers ferment for another two days, at which point I uh, measured them with a, a hydrometer to make sure that they had reached OG. And each of them had, which is also really interesting. The hot mash uh, version ended at 10.07, 1.007 FG or around 0.3 ABV. Uh, and the cold mash ended at 1.001 FG or around 0.4 ABV. So almost identical ABV d- despite starting OG and FG. Well, so the, the but you you look at it. So the hot mash batch went from nine to seven. So a a, a law a, a a delta of two specific gravity points. Uh, the cold mash one went from four to one, so a delta of three specific gravity points. That's about the same. I mean, you could even argue that that maybe that's measurement error and that these actually had similar uh, attenuation. The reality is 0.3% versus 0.4%, eh, that's that's nothing. Yeah. <laughs> that is absolutely yeah. nothing. Uh, and uh, what's interesting to me, though, is that the hot mash one did seem to confirm what we expect from higher mash temperatures, right? That that when that alpha amylase is active, the, that or more active than beta amylase, at least, that you aren't going to get as much attenuation. And this, I mean, is, even though the OG was so low to start with, 10.09, only 1007. I mean, it didn't attenuate very much at all. So it did what we expect. Thank you, science. We love that. Mm-hmm. Same thing with the cold mash. Uh, those enzymes did not have enough time to convert that starch into sugar. And so it just did not attenuate very much. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And, and and of course, we didn't measure the ABV on these. I mean, that's just a calculation, the estimation using right, stoichiometry. Right. So, um, all right. And so then the beers were, uh, so at, at, at the end, beers have reached their terminal gravity. I cold crashed them and pressure transferred them to CO2 purged kegs uh, that I put in my keyser and allowed to lager for another two weeks uh, before I served them to tasters. So, Cade, question. I'm looking at these beers right now. They're up on my screen, and uh, it's pretty (laughs) obvious that they look different. Uh, Now, they were mashed completely different. I guess I wasn't terribly surprised, but I'm curious what you speculate, at least, uh, accounts for this difference. For those who aren't looking at the picture with me right now, the hot mash beer was definitely hazier, uh, and it looks lighter in color because of that haze. The way we know about the way light reflects off of particulates and all of that. And the cold mash beer is actually quite a bit clearer, and um, you know has a little bit more, in my opinion, a little bit more of like a yellow color to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, interestingly, looking at the pictures of these, I I think both beers don't look very. Um, up- appetizing or appealing <laughs> i wasn't gonna say it <laughs> you know, but <laughs> you know but i mean they, they don't really look great uh you know uh, they, they tasted good i liked both of them um so they tasted good but yeah I, I do have a theory on this and i think it's proteins um so i think the high mash temperature solubilized more proteins um into solution so just other things that are that are you know in the beer that are around those starches um i, I think it just it solubilized them and and the enzymes that would normally be there like proteinases and beta gluconases and all this other stuff uh, that would normally be there to break down those proteins were denatured 
Um, so not only did we get dextrins out of the beer, we also got proteins. And proteins, we know, are very uh, common haze-forming uh, molecules. Proteins mix with um, hop acids and create haze. Uh, and, and so I think that's why the high mash temperature beer looked more hazy. Or at least that's my best guess. That's an educated guess about why it's hazier. Now, neither of these beers were fined. Um, so they're both got a little bit of haze to them. But I think the cold mash beer just didn't have as many proteins that were pulled into solution so it looks a lot cleaner and a lot clearer that's my guess it, 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 your guess is as good as mine and that's about the, <laughs> the the path that i would have taken as well so tell us you, you said you enjoyed both of these beers and i and and i commend you for that i think that's great uh <laughs> what, <laughs> what i want to know is could you tell them apart we have a we have a, a routine where uh, rather than just sharing our anecdotal thoughts which you can find in every other you know uh home brewing realm or or forum uh we we really do try to at least provide some level of of uh, blind data, even from our own impressions. And so we have a routine where we do a series of at least five personal triangle tests. We call them semi-blind. We know that the difference between the beers, but we have them serve to us in a you know in a blind fashion, and we try to see if we can distinguish uh, the odd beer out. How was your experience doing that, kid? Yeah, so I did five triangle tests and I was consistently and I would say confidently able to pick out the odd beer uh, in all of them in all five of them. Uh, it, it, it wasn't really close to me. There were there were I mean, they were close, right? I mean, there, it wasn't like a stout versus an IPA or something. I mean, you know, there, there were similar beers, but they were different. Um, the hot mash beer actually tasted like what I would consider a commercial non-alcoholic beer to taste like. Um, it had a nice mouthfeel. It had some nice hop character to it, a little bit of bitterness had some body to it uh the cold mash beer was more like a a, a light lager um I, I guess let me let me clarify the hot mash beer tasted what like what i was going for a hoppy lager um and the cold mash beer just tasted like a, a light like you know um i don't know like an american light lager right with no alcohol in it it was yeah. kind of watery and thinner bodied it did have some hop character to it um which was great if you were going for just beer flavored beer non-alcohol <laughs> Um, you know, beer, I guess, if that makes sense, <laughs> then that, that cold mash beer was right there. I mean, that was exactly, uh, you know, what you would get. It was like beer flavored beer, non-alcohol beer. Um, and, but the other one, the hot mash was, uh, the, was the one that I, I, I had a slight preference for, uh, because again, it tasted more like what I was going for. It had a nice hop character and a nice mild bitterness to it. But again, both tasted fine, right? Both tasted good. They, they just were different. And, and the hot mash was what I was going for in this case so hence my preference yeah i mean just based on your description i have a feeling that uh you know if forced to drink one of these i probably would want the hop the hot mash beer uh just because of the mouthfeel piece of it and what you described as it having just more of a dry hop character i suppose but uh i do think it's interesting that you got it 100 percent of the time we're able to, to tell it apart and you know other besides the mash temperature i mean this really is one of our very first mash temperature experiments that came back uh with the 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 brew or being able to tell them apart. What about our blind tasters? You served these beers to 17 participants. We typically aim for 20, but in this case, we just were comfortable cutting it off in part because out of the 10 that we were, <laughs> we were expecting to get it right in order for us to say that it was significant, how many actually did? <laughs> yeah, we had 15 out of 17. 15 <laughs> out of 17. <laughs> Yeah, that's like eighty-eight percent of the tasters uh, f were able to tell these uh, t tell these apart. Um, so yeah, I mean, if we had gotten up to twenty, even if you had given three, you know, even if they had all gotten it wrong, it still would have been significant. You know, Way. so uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 you know, I mean, yeah, that's where we sort of felt comfortable cutting it off. And, and it, it's interesting too. like the preference data on this was kind of interesting. I, I think um, I don't normally like preference data, but <laughs> this is sort of goes back to that. Like, you know, they're both good, but different um, of the 15 tasters who were right. Nine of them preferred the, the hot mash beer and six preferred the cold mash beer. So, you know, not not exactly 50 50, but pretty close. Yeah, uh, that, that there were people that like both of them um and again I, I think that was kind of like what how i my perception too one tasted more just like a light lager uh that had no alcohol and the other one was a little bit hoppier and had a little bit uh better mouthfeel you know this this is one of the few experiments where i i kind of wish 
uh, we had a question before the preference question. Do you actually like this beer? Yes or no? And then whether <laughs> whether you do whether you do or you don't, you know which which one of the you know of the two here in front of you now do you know do you prefer? I'm just. Did you talk to anybody after the fact? I know this is completely anecdotal. This, but did you talk to anybody after the fact and get their impressions just on the beer in general? Yeah, most people didn't like it. <laughs> I mean, so I'm not alone. People, you're, we weren't alone, at least not in this case. I mean, and who knows? You know what I mean? I'm just serving this to people who, the, like, you know, homebrew, homebrewers who are normal yeah, beer drinkers who exactly. love beer. Exactly. Uh, you know, and again, this was first t- attempt ever that I had made at a non-alcoholic beer. Uh, so, so, but, you know, ultimately, I, I liked it. it. It hit what I wanted it to, to be like. But again, this is not for everybody. I mean, hoppy lagers aren't necessarily what uh, everybody wants to drink. Uh, especially whenever they're talking about non-alcoholic beers. But yeah, no, I mean, I would say most of the people that I talked to were like, oh, this is, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to drink this. Nobody said like, ooh, this is gross. Yeah, nobody, nobody was like, ooh, this is gross. I'm not drinking it. They were just like, yeah, this was weird. Because of course, I didn't tell them that it was a non-alcoholic beer. <laughs> yeah. You know, I just like yeah. serve it to them and then let them do their triangle test and then talk to them about it afterwards. So they had no idea. I mean, they think they're drinking a beer and it doesn't taste like it. It tastes like a non-alcoholic beer. Yeah, and I think... Y- you and and probably unwittingly uh, kind of proved my point is that non-alcoholic beer doesn't usually taste like real beer uh, as hard as you know these breweries try now what's amazing to me i just saw the brewers association's you know top 50 breweries and if i'm not mistaken athletic brewing company which only makes na beer is like the 13th biggest brewery uh, right now uh, which is crazy that just blows my mind. I'm scrolling through the list and I see athletic and I'm going, what the hell? A non-alcoholic. I mean, that kudos to them. I could go on forever about that. The reality is there's a market for it. People want it. And what the, the, the contention that I had in the bruise views episode and that I'll repeat here is that I think it's perfectly okay to say non-alcoholic beer is its own thing. It doesn't have to taste exactly like the analog that it's copying. You know, that that's not the key. And when you try to sell it as that, it, it almost turns me off or, and, and maybe there's other people out there like me that are going, but it's not the same. I, and that's why I would rather just drink water. You know, oh, um, I'm proud of you, Marshall. You've yeah. come a long way. Yeah. Hey, you know, I'm softening <laughs> up a little bit. No, I mean, I, I don't hate it. I, I, I genuinely, and I mean it when I say this, that I love, I, I, I have a, I'm a psychologist. I have an appreciation for people who recognize when they have an issue and they're going to avoid the very thing that causes those issues. Do it. You know, if you have an issue, don't drink beer, don't drink alcohol. And, and if this is something that you can, you can supplant, you know, alcoholic beer with, and you enjoy it, I love that that is an option. My personal opinion is that I've yet to have one that I've enjoyed. And, and here's the thing. I've had quite a few. Somehow I've yet to land my hands on any athletic beer. Chances of me paying for it are very <laughs> slim. I, I would just rather, and I, and I say that honestly, I would, I, I don't, I'm not, I don't need non-alcoholic beer in my life. And so if somebody is, is serving me one, that's, that's how I've had most of the NA beers uh, that I've tried to date are, you know, I'm out and about and somebody who doesn't drink alcohol is like, Hey, have you tried this non-alcoholic craft porter or pale ale? And I have have uh they they share it with me and i've not been a fan i'd rather have water but i'm open to this idea of of certain methods whether that be mash temperature or some of these other ones that i'm sure we'll experiment with more in the future uh, if you can produce a beer tasting beer that doesn't have alcohol i mean all the better for those who want a non-alcoholic analog to beer i think that's really neat yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, I, I think there's a lot of people out there that are interested in this. I mean, and, and you know, uh, cutting back on alcohol even during weeknights. And this is still cool, right? Like as a home brewer, you can still make non-alcoholic beer. You don't have to have fancy filtration equipment or membrane filters or, you know, uh, worry about pasteurizing or like, you know, heat, heat. Uh, volatilizing the alcohol. Um, it's pretty cool to think that just this easily, you know, by just doing a little higher or a little lower mash temperature, you can make a non-alcoholic beer uh, at home. And but that that does sort of raise one other thing I wanted to be care be to to be sure to mention on this episode is be careful brewing non-alcoholic beer at home. I mean, we're very used to working in a, a, a beer that has high or has a low pH and a high alcohol content um, with a high 
high CO2 concentration. And those things are usually pretty good at killing off any of those pathogens or any, you know, bad microbes or bacteria that could spoil your beer. And non-alcoholic beer has none of that except maybe the CO2 concentration. It doesn't have a low pH generally. It doesn't have any alcohol that's going to make it more difficult for beer to be there. And it's going to have a whole bunch of unfermentable dextrins that are there ready to go um, if some bug gets into your beer. So be careful. Mind your pH. You know, don't leave the beer in the fermenter longer than necessary. Watch your draft lines. Clean your fermenters. Clean your stuff. Um, Just kind of a PSA there. Be careful brewing these at home. I don't want anybody getting, you know, poisoned by making non-alcoholic beers um, (laughs) at home. Yeah. Or wasting your money on doing it and then, you know, batch after batch is contaminated and just tastes like crap. Uh, I I actually, uh, you know, non-alcoholic brewing, this is perfect for one gallon batch experimentation, iterative process, you know, doing it over and over until you land on something you know works and then you can scale up. Uh, But again, really neat stuff. We've got more non I mean, it's so hot right now, the the whole non-alcoholic market. Uh, we've got more experiments that we will be getting to in the future, but I thought this was a very interesting one, and it does seem, in the end, that cold mashing produces a qualitatively different beer than hot mashing when both are about the same ABV, which is almost nothing uh, in the end. Pretty interesting stuff. We did get a couple of uh, reader comments we're going to get to. The first one comes from uh, Brewlosophy common commenter, uh, Will Allwart. He says, seeing that the attenuation uh, was about 23% on the high mash temp beer, do you think starting with a slightly higher OG, like 1015 or 10, to 1020, would leave you with a slightly higher FG, something like 1013 to 1015, thus adding more mouthfeel and flavor? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it depends, right, on your mashing temperature. Yeah, you, you know, if you're doing the uh, high mash temperature, um, you know, uh, 180, 180 or around 82 Celsius, um, y- yes, you can probably get a higher OG and still have a low fermentation. Yeah. The where, where I worry is as you increase the OG, as you start to get higher and higher, you just want to keep in mind that you are increasing the possibility that more sugar is just getting into the wort because you're having to use more grains, right? right? So there's free sugar that's in those grains that's going to get extracted into the wort. If you keep dumping more grains in there, you're going to increase that level of fermentable sugar that's in the beer. It may be the same percentage. I don't know, right? It might be 23%. If you just did this over and over again, you might see that it's still that 23% attenuation. Um, It may be that, but I just that's the only concern I have. Scientifically, totally seems to make sense if you just put more grains in and mash at that higher temperature, you won't create some, you know, super fermentable wort, um, but you'll be able to have a higher uh, or uh, a higher OG and a higher FG. Just be be mindful that as you do add more grains, you add a vector for more fermentable sugars to be introduced. Yeah, I, the the point that I want to make on this, and I think it will your 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 mind works like mine. This is exactly. I think I commented on this earlier, even. And in fact, the short and shoddy session IPA that I brewed was based off of this idea that that if I if I want to get just as much flavor because a big problem with session IPA is that it's just palate. It's boring. It's kind of flabby. They don't taste very good. Well, what if I could get, you know, we've done multiple mash temp experiments where people couldn't taste the difference despite a rather drastic difference in ABV. Well, if I go to an extreme and I mash at say 165 F uh, with the same exact grain bill that I might use for a pale ale that ends up being five and a half percent, but because I mash so high, this one ends up being, you know, sub 4%. I think it's a good way to get away with flavorful session IPA uh, or session beers in general. Um, you know, the the concern that I would have is that if you're a t- if you're going even higher than that, like you said, then you've got all of these fermentable sugars that want to be alcohol and CO two uh, ostensibly, uh, and and microbes just somehow sometimes find a way into these things, and it could end up you know really turning on you. Now I do want to comment that uh, Brewlosophy contributor Alex Shanks Abel, one of the things that they do quite often uh, as somebody who wants you know lower ABV beers is mash upwards of one sixty two to one sixty five just to restrict total attenuation. So their beers are coming out with lower ABV despite being made 
Uh, otherwise, it, you know, same recipes and same process as a, a beer that might regularly be mashed down at 150 Fahrenheit and produce a point and a half more uh, alcohol. So it does work. Uh, and, and according to Alex, they're coming out pretty good. So next comment comes from Ernie Ward, who says, I cold mash my NA beer for 18 hours at 45 degrees Fahrenheit uh, with good results. I don't know if that's, for, yeah, 45 Fahrenheit. That's really cold. That's like in the fridge. Uh, I had a small amount of oats for mouthfeel. So that's an interesting approach is you using a different grain to imp, imp, to boost up that mouthfeel that you might get from a hot mash, uh, but in beers that are cold mashed over more time. Yeah, that's interesting. And that, uh, you know, the, the oats are also going to have a little bit of fermentable sugar in them too. But yeah, I mean, nice for mouth. That's like sort of a combination, right? You're trying to get that mouthfeel still, uh, you know, that you would get from a hot, a hot mash temperature, but doing it at, at cold temperature. And yeah, that 45 degrees at, at uh, for 18 hours, that surprises me that you're still able to get, uh, you know, uh, the, the, fermentable sugars in there but again i mean these things are free that's just kind of getting access to them they'll solubilize readily into water as long as the water gets close to them as long as you're not freezing the water um but yeah that's really interesting and really cool to see that you can do it even at those low temperatures i mean that is something that does also bring up something i mentioned earlier is a lot of people are you know cold steeping for longer than an hour right and i think if i were going to do this cold steeping mesh method again i would definitely do it for longer than an hour um you know maybe not you know, all day, maybe not overnight, maybe overnight. I don't know. Exactly. I'd have to think through what I want, but, (laughs) uh, but yeah, I I would probably do it longer than an hour just to see if it could get more, uh, you know, of, of something solubilized out of that word other than just, I mean, it was so low gravity, 1007 and 1004, or uh, sorry, uh, 1004 down to 1001. There we go. Um, uh, you know, that, that I wonder also if that just made it like thin and watery because there just wasn't a lot in it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You know, so, Yep. Well, I'll tell you what, I, you know, this is such uh, we are we are in the uh, in, you know infancy of non-alcoholic brewing, at least on the uh, craft and homebrew scales, in my opinion. I mean, I first beer I ever drank with us was a sharps that some I think my mom gave it to me one time. <laughs> I'm not saying how great a parents they were, but, uh, you know, that's been around for a long time uh, either way. And now, you know, as we're moving into people wanting more variety in their non-alcoholic beers and, you know, the, the I think the 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 trend towards fitness and and health is only going to continue to grow, which is a great thing. You're going to start to see more and more people making these beers, which is also going to increase uh, the, the uh, I guess, what we know about how to make them better. And uh, as much as I may not be a fan of that, I absolutely love, again, that they're, that they're are those people out there who are pushing the envelope when it comes to, uh, you know, making non-alcoholic beers. And I think we're going to see some neat stuff here in the future. So that is all the time we've got for this episode. Kate, do you have any final comments? No, I, I think uh, if you want to brew some non-alcoholic beer, this certainly you know demonstrated you can make non-alcoholic beer using these methods and super easy to do uh, from a homebrew level. So yeah, uh, you know, go ahead and use these methods. And if you uh, test this out, send me your results because I'd be interested to know what you think. Yeah, and if you come up with something that we didn't discuss in this episode, also let us know. We may even put it to the test in a future experiment. All right, don't forget to subscribe to The Brew Lab where uh, Cade takes you into the lab with real brewing scientists to discuss the fascinating research they've done on our favorite beverage and as always you can read more about the experiment we discussed by clicking the link to the article on brewlosophy.com in the description of this episode the brewlosophy podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors as well as all of our rad listeners we seriously could not do this without you cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show it makes a huge difference if you haven't yet please consider doing so head over to brewlosophy.com support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast if you want a reward for your support visit patreon.com brewlosophy thanks again for listening we'll be back next week with another episode of the brewlosophy podcast until then think beer Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it soothes my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go through the middle man no more.